Okay, it's going to be quite a short teaching today compared to what we normally have, but this verse is so important that we live it out that I didn't really want to squash it on the back or, or the front of another teaching, so I thought we'd spend some time with this one. It's called the Golden Rule, and it's Matthew 7, verse 12. This is it. In everything, treat others as you would want them to treat you, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Now, we're all experts in knowing how we want other people to treat us. Like, anyone want to guess, how many minutes do you think we spend a day thinking about how we want other people to treat us? I was trying to work this out last night, and I realise it depends if I'm having a good day or a bad day. But I estimated about 30 minutes. I think if you're having a bad day, I think you're looking at a couple of hours. Uh, You know, when you're driving along, and you're like, oh, he didn't treat me very well, and then you're annoyed at him, or the bus driver's a bit rude to you, and you're like, he didn't treat me very well. Or, you know, all the time we're thinking, oh, I want to be treated better. And I worked out, this might not be helpful to you, but if it is, if we spend 30 minutes a day thinking about this, in a week we spent three and a half hours thinking about it, in a month we spent 15 hours, in a year we spent 182 hours, and in a lifetime, if we live to a 70, then we've spent one and a half years thinking about how we want to be treated. I mean, you can imagine saying, like, are you going to college? No, I'm just going to spend a year and a half thinking about how I want people to treat me. It would be kind of like that. So the point I'm trying to make is we're all experts in how we want people to treat us. I know I am. So the thing is, I can either be a whinge bag and always think about how I want people to treat me, or I can use that in a positive way the way Jesus is teaching us here, to then use my knowledge of how I want to be treated to then bless other people. So, let's break it down. First thing, this applies to every situation. You notice the first two words there. What's it say? In everything, right? So, this applies to everything. And I think it's worth pointing that out because sometimes we do separate our spiritual life from other aspects of life. Like we might separate our spiritual life from our job um, or from school or college or whatever. And we might act one way when we're praying on our knees and another way when we're arguing with our boss or a colleague or a family member or whatever. And I've often heard people say, yeah, but my situation's different. And I can understand why people think that, but that is us not really understanding this verse, because here it says, in everything. So even if someone's been really bad to you, Jesus is still saying, in that situation, treat others as you would have them treat you. So the application is, think about people you know at work, at school, in the family, uh, people on the street, and think, are there people who I'm treating in a bad way? And if you're a human being, you're bound to find (laughs) there are a couple of people. So this is just a gentle reminder this morning, like, Let's not be doing that. Let's apply this to every situation. Next point I want to make is that this is more than not being bad. It's about being good. It's more than not being bad. It's about being good. All right, explain that. The text doesn't say what you hate, do not do to anyone. But this is how a lot of people interpret it. In fact, this is what it says in the Jewish book of Tobit for Verse 15, it says, What you hate, do not do to anyone. And you'll find the same teaching in Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Greek and Roman ethical teaching. So this is common. A lot of people say this. And we think it sometimes. We think Jesus is saying, Look, if you don't like someone being bad man to you, don't be bad man to them. And we can think that. But that is only half of what Jesus is saying. What Jesus says instead is, In everything, treat them as you want them to treat you. So it involves doing good to people as well as not doing bad. So if I like people to make me a cup of tea, then (laughs) I should make people a cup of tea when they come around my house. Uh, It's not just about saying, oh, I won't gossip about them. It's about doing good things for them as well. Now check this out, because this is deep. I only noticed this by looking in a commentary. They pointed out that in Matthew 25, when it talks about the judgment at the end times, God judges people for what they didn't do. It's quite deep. We'll read it out. It's quite a few verses, but it's worth reading. Matthew 25, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, 
Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that if you don't make someone a cup of tea when they come around your house, you're going to hell, okay? And we haven't got time to study Matthew 25. We will be doing that in a few months' time when we get to that part in Matthew. But I just want to show you the principle that God judged them because of things they didn't do. And sometimes people call this sins of omission. Anyone heard that phrase before? You've got sins of commission, which are things you do wrong, like shouting at someone, and then you've got sins of omission, which are things you don't do, like maybe you see an old lady getting beaten up in the street, and you just walk on. That would be a sin of omission. Um, it's something you don't do. So I think it's important to notice, because it's easy for us to focus on the negative application of the golden rule, you know, where we just think, let's not do bad things to people. Like I might think, I must not be rude to people at work. Instead of thinking, I must do good things to the people at work. I must bless them. So let's look at the negative applications. Gossip, that's an obvious one. Put your hand up if you like being gossiped about. <laughs> Thought so. So we don't like being gossiped about, so let's not gossip about other people. Um, anyone like people being rude to them? No. So let's not be rude to people. Is anyone like anyone being angry at them, getting all up in their face? No. So let's not be angry to people. What about, does anyone enjoy being lied to? Okay, so let's not lie. What about people being unreliable? I really don't like that when people are unreliable to me. So I then need to make sure I'm not unreliable to other people as well. Okay, so anyone think of any other negative applications? There, there must be more. These are the only ones I wrote down. Anyone think of anything? You guys are just too holy. All right, let's look at the positive ones then. Positive applications, okay. Hospitality, yeah. Uh, hospitality is when someone comes around, making them feel welcome, giving them drinks, giving them food. It's very biblical, hospitality. It comes up many times in the Bible about being hospitable. So I, I think this is something we can really do. And I know it's hard to do. Right? Sometimes you're tired and you've got people sitting in your house and you realize I haven't offered anyone a drink or any food. And you're like, but I feel so comfortable sitting here. But then I know if I'm in someone's house and they don't offer me a drink, I'm thinking, cool, when are they going to offer me a drink? So we should do it. It's good to be hospitable. Another one I think is hearing people out. You know, when someone's trying to explain something to us, this is something I'm probably bad at, is hearing people out. But sometimes, even when you understand what someone's going to say to you, they need to know that you're hearing them out anyway. So it's worth being like, I think I've heard their argument three times already, but I'm going to let them say it one more time anyway, because they have a need to be heard. Um, so that's something I want to work on. 
Then another one is showing respect to people. You know, most of us have grown up with that whole thing of only respect those who respect you, and it's rubbish. <laughs> it's not in the Bible anywhere. So we should, you know, even dare I say it, we should show respect to the police. Now that can be hard. Some of the things that we might see happen by certain individuals in the police force, we still should show them respect. The Bible is quite clear about how we should treat authority.、Um, I think God will bless you if, if you do that. Show them respect to parents. Show them respect to the guys who work here in the building, who keep the place running, and even traffic wardens. You know, there's no verse that says you don't have to show respect to traffic wardens.、Um, then you got spending time with people. I, I think often when you ask people when have you felt the most loved by someone, they normally give you an instance where it was someone taking time out to help them. So you know that's one way we can treat people the way we want to be treated. Spend time with people.、Um, yeah. Then we got、uh, giving money.、Um, I'm not talking about putting money in a collection. I'm talking about if there's a friend in need. I remember one time we went to play football somewhere near Roehampton, and they just done some crazy thing with the road, which meant for me to turn back into the estate. I had to, for one metre, drive on a bus lane because they made the bus lane go right up to the turning in the road. So I did it as safely as I could, but then the thing flashed. I got sent a fifty-pound、uh, parking ticket, and I was like, "Boy, how am I going to do this?" And one of the guys in the car with us—it was actually Daper—he paid it. You know, and he won't drive him, but he was just like, "You know what? I want to give you the money for that." You know, and that, and that blessed me, and that's something we can do for other people.、Uh, Not necessarily got to pay all your mates' parking fines and whatnot, but there's always times where one of us is strapped for cash, and it's great if someone can can help them out. And the other one is just helping people in whatever shape or form.、Um, anyone think of any other things you could add to that list? Walks, thoughts, having having positive thoughts to people as yeah. That, that's very important because you have negative thoughts to people, and it just seems to fester and grow and get worse and worse. So yeah, I think having positive thoughts to people is good.、Um, we often focus on people's bad points, but would we want people to focus on our bad points? So instead, it's always worth trying to think what is a good point someone's got, and then focus on that. Okay, now these aren't things that we're naturally inclined to do, but this is the way of the disciple. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, this is His way. It literally says in Matthew seven twelve. In when you look at the Greek of it, it literally says, "You treat others as you would want them to treat you." It makes the "you" emphatic. So it's not just saying treat others. He's saying you, you guys treat others. And a scholar called Leon Morris basically says that this is emphasizing that Jesus is teaching His disciples. So this is Jesus saying, "Hey, you're going to be my disciples and follow me. This is important, and that's why this is the only verse we're looking at today. Because although it's kind of simple in a way, and you're not going to walk away blown away like, 'Wow, that was an amazing exegesis of this verse,' but this is something where Jesus said, 'Hey, you want to be disciples? You got to live this out.、Um, you can't avoid this rule.' And I know that sometimes as di- disciples we can think, 'Yeah, let's go to Bible studies.'" And let's pray, and let's do evangelism, and all those things are good. And we can think, yeah, we're being hardcore disciples. But if we're not living out the golden rule of treating others as we want them to treat you, then we're not really being true disciples. So let's look at the next thing Jesus says. He says, "In everything, treat others as you would want them to treat you, for this fulfills the law and the prophets." It actually literally says, "This is the law and the prophets." So what I see this as is the idiot's guide to following the law. You know, I get them books, the idiot's guide to Microsoft Windows or whatever. This is the idiot's guide to following the law, and it's good because, you know, in the Old Testament, there's over 600 laws, and there's no way you're going to memorize all of those laws. So here we've got it kind of summed up for us.、Uh, the Pharisees were completely misusing the laws. We've been studying that for the last six months how they misused them. And the Old Testament laws were. See if you can remember this word, paradigmatic. Anyone ever heard that word before? Paradigmatic. You can use it now. Show off to people. What it means is the Old Testament laws were designed in a way that they showed 
patterns for how to deal with situations. Whereas British law these days is very rigid.、Uh, I'm not explaining it well. Let me give you an example. If I come to your house this afternoon and your back door is open and I walk in and steal something, I'm probably not going to get done, am I? Anyone know why? What didn't I do? Yeah, the door was left open. I didn't break anything. It's not breaking and entering, right? Now that is the way British law works. There isn't a specific law to say, well, if you walk in through the door that's open and take something, then it's burglary. So,、uh, as far as I understand it, so we know that there's loads of holes in British law, which is why people get away with many things they do because they find loopholes in the law. People do it with their taxes all the time. Now, Old Testament law was different. It was paradigmatic. So, for example, one law says you need to build a parapet on the roof of your house. In other words, you need a kind of fence around the roof of your house. It just says that. Now, obviously, the reason is that someone on your could come to your roof and fall off and hurt themselves. Now, the kind of thing the Pharisees would do is say, "Okay, as long as we got a parapet, we're okay." But the paradigmatic Law really is saying, "Hey, in all things, you need to be concerned about the safety of your neighbour." Okay, so that means I can't leave broken glass outside my front door and just say, "Well, it's up to my neighbour to not walk in it." You know, biblically, I need to clear it up. So that's just to explain what a paradigmatic law is, and what Jesus is saying is, "Hey, really, the ultimate meaning of all these paradigmatic laws is." Treat others as you would want them to treat you. That's what sums it all up. So, rather than spending a whole year, Jesus teaching them over 600 laws and how to apply them, he just gives us this very simple way to apply all of the implications. And he does this later in Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment." The second is like it: love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So it's very similar teaching. Now, we've all been in situations where we wonder if something is right or wrong to do. And maybe you phone up a friend and say, "I've got a situation with someone. I don't know how to handle it." Well, you can still do that, but we kind of got the answer here. We got the answer in how would you want to be treated in that situation? So, most people have a boss or a teacher at college or school. Most of us have someone who's in leadership over us, and leadership is a difficult job. And I think one of the applications we can do is, when someone's in leadership over us and we've got a problem with them, consider how would we want to be treated if we were in that situation. When I was at school, I wish now I'd done this for my teachers. Because I just saw all the teachers as the enemy, thought I could be rude to them, and now, as someone who teaches in a college, <laughs> now I realise, like, boy, it's hard being a teacher. You got 25 people there in your classroom. You got to show each one individual care and respect, know what's going on in their life at the time, treat them in the right way, never be short with them, and it's impossible to do that.、Um, and so now I'm like, boy, what have people in my life who are in leadership above me? And I'm not always understanding where they're coming from. So now I'm thinking, okay, try and understand where is my colleague at work coming from? Where's my boss coming from? Where is my pastor coming from? Where you know whoever it is, and then then try and deal with them in the way I would want to be treated.、Uh, same thing was if you have an argument with your neighbour, how would you want to be treated? How would you want your neighbour to be coming to you? Or someone in the street, how would you want them to treat you?、Um, So let's sum all this up. As I said, very short teaching today, very simple, but it's important we live it out. To sum up, sorry about that. <laughs> this applies to all situations of life. Jesus said, "In everything, it involves not being bad to people, but it also involves doing good to people." And God does judge for the things that we don't do. So lose the mindset of as long as we don't do sex, drugs, and rock and roll, we're okay. Because God might say, "Yeah, but what about all the people I brought into your life that I wanted you to care for?" And I think sometimes we just think, as long as I don't do these, I'm cool. And yet God's got somebody's brought into our life, and we've ignored them.、Um, this is the way of a disciple. If you want to be disciples, Bible studies fun, prayer meetings are fun.、Uh, 
Uh, evangelism is fun, but this is really crucial as well. And this is a way to make decisions about how to deal with people. Just ask, how do I want to be treated? So if you've realized today there's things you need to stop in your life, like I've realized looking at this, then stop them. <laughs> And if you haven't, then praise God, but maybe you've been convicted of some things that you should start doing for someone in your life. Um, so if that's the case, then go ahead and do it. Uh, God will bless you for it. Um, and what it means is instead of us always focusing on how we want people to treat us, our lives will change because we now start thinking, okay, how am I going to treat other people? And then we move from victim mentality into something else. And on that note, just to close, I'll share that probably all heard the verse in Isaiah where it says wonderful counsellor okay and uh, that has been applied sometimes to the counselling situation where people say God is your counsellor he will help you with problems I just want to share something about the meaning of the word if you look in the net bible they've actually translated it as extraordinary strategist and it sounds weird when you see it because your whole life you've heard it wonderful counsellor but when you see their reason for it it's very convincing because a counsellor was someone that gave you advice and more times it's someone who's given the king advice in battle now the reason why I share that is it's on the whole victim mentality thing when we think of counseling and getting counseling from God we can sometimes think I'm a victim God will counsel me but what if we view it as God is a strategist he's a mighty warrior in battle he knows how to fight battles and he will help me fight the battles in my life then we're going to move from victim mentality to soldier mentality. And when we view God as counselling us, we're going to view it as him giving us advice and giving us tools to wage war in the heavenlies. But the main emphasis of today is treat other people as you want them to treat you. Any questions? All right, I'm just going to pray. God... This seems so easy to understand, but so hard to live out. So I just pray that you would enable us to live this out. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to live this out. Uh, help us to be obedient to your word. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And where there's needs, help us to see those and to not walk around blind, ignoring needs that are going around us. Help us to be more caring to one another. Help us to glorify you, Jesus. Amen.